Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Decatur. Sixty years ago this summer, the Korean War began. It was one of the most intense and bloodiest wars in our history. So why am I at the Macon County History Museum? Well, an exhibit just opened, and we're here to talk to some of the veterans who fought in that war. Pat McDaniel, 60 years ago, the Korean War started, and for a lot of Americans, it's sort of enigmatic. You know, it's sort of like it happened after World War II and before the Vietnam War, and they don't really know what it was. Some people call it the Forgotten War. Exactly. It was, uh, when you think back, uh, it was kind of a watershed time period in, in the history of America. We had just gone through the uh, World War II. People were tired of wars. And then all of a sudden, here's another uh, uh, conflict uh, that, matter of fact, it was really the first Cold, uh, Cold War conflict mm -hmm. where the UN, UN was involved and technically the, the war was under the UN flag. Mm -hmm. And uh, the U.S. Congress had not declared it a war. It was more of a police action. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was known as the Forgotten War yeah. in that standpoint. But also people were tired of war. They didn't want to uh, even think about it. And uh, it was a, a sad time. Mm -hmm. And and also with it being a watershed, uh, also for the military, it was uh, you know, you would think after World War II, everybody was prepared for any more battles. Well, we really weren't prepared for another war. Right. And uh, but through the through the Korean War, we kind of moved into some some areas of uh, jets started uh, jet planes started to be using in in the war. Uh, we also had uh, helicopter helicopters started mm -hmm. being used. So mm -hmm. again, it was a watershed period in in American history when when people. You know, you had more people not really interested in fighting the war. Uh, you didn't have that during World War One or World War Two, right, right. but you had that during the Korean War, and it and and, and fortunately, it's progressed up to this time yeah. period. I'm We're here on day one of the opening of this exhibit at the Macon County History Museum. Exactly. We're gonna, during this program, we're going to take a look at your material here. We're also going to talk to some of those Korean War veterans who came in here today for the, for the ribbon cutting, okay? But let's, set some, let's just set some basics here first. You've got a really good map here of North and South Korea, which shows here's the demilitarized zone between North th and South the Korea. The 38th parallel, yes. And here's South Korea down here, North Korea here. Now here's the China border. Right. This, of course, had, had, it was very important because China uh, came in later in the war, came in and actually became uh, an ally of North Korea, trying to chase the American troops out of North Korea. Uh, up over here, you've got Russia, which, of course, I, I guess you would say really started this thing by backing North Korea. Right. They? Well, they were, the, uh, they were kind of pulling the strings for North Korea. And uh, they were the silent uh, uh, partners in this. Uh, and of course, like I said, China later on came in with, with uh, hundreds of thousands of, of troops. Uh, the Korean Peninsula, uh, I recently read, was more kind of like Belgium over in Europe. It was kind of everybody went through Korea to get, uh, get mm -hmm. to any place. Uh, it had been fought over for, for centuries. Yeah. Of course, uh, Japan uh, was the ruler of Korea from 1910 until 1945. Mm -hmm. We're still fighting over it. Yeah, we are. It was never really, a, 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 even though they had an armistice talks and there was a declaration uh, that ended the, the police action of war, it really has not mm -hmm. ended. Really has okay, we ended. talked about six years ago. Let's walk down this uh, way a little bit. Now, here's a, here's a nice uh, headline which tells that. This is from June of, of uh, 1950, North Korea Reds Declare War. That's, that's what started it all. On June uh, uh, 27th, 1950, mm -hmm. the Koreans uh, uh, invaded over the, uh, the 38th parallel and uh, captured the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, capital of uh, uh, Republic of South Korea, which mm -hmm. was uh, Seoul. Here's the, here's the main players. We, we talked about Russia. Joseph Stalin, USSR. Mao Zedong, Communist China. Kim Sung, North Korea. Syngman Rae, North, South Korea. Dwight D. Eisenhower, President of the U.S. Harry Truman, President of the U.S. And you, you have to remember also, as I said, uh, uh, during the, the uh, presidential uh, uh, campaign in, in uh, 1952 and that, that was a, that was a significant uh, issue in the war. Uh, Americans wanted us out of Korea. And again, history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. What do we have now with Afghanistan and, mm -hmm. and uh, Iraq and that? So and look at the terrain. Look at oh, the terrain. Yes. Now, I, we're going to talk to some of these veterans about the terrain, but they say this was, for the ones who were in Vietnam and South Korea, or and Korea, they say the terrain made that a much more difficult. Well, the terrain and, of course, the weather. I mean, uh, the weather was freezing you know, winter, and then it'd just be sweltering hot and humid. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it was... Uh, 
you know, you, you had different weather fronts in, in other wars, but this one was, mm -hmm. was very critical in, in fighting of the war, and it played a substantial uh, uh, element in, in the, how you fought the war. Jerry Seymour, you live in Mount Auburn now. Right. But back when you were 17 years old, they sent you over to Korea, didn't they? I enlisted in the Army from Alton. Mm -hmm. Lied about my age. 17 years old. Got falsified my brother's birth certificate and uh, went in the Army at the age of 16, 1948. Mm -hmm. At the age of 16. By the time you got to Korea, you were 17. Right. Mm -hmm. they, had, they were flying you over enemy lines and dropping you down, weren't they? And you were just supposed to go, what, chart territory for them? Well, they didn't drop us because uh, the terrain doesn't allow parachute oh, jumps. It's that rough. Yeah, huh? It's yeah. too rough over there. Yeah. We had two parachute drops by the 187th Airborne. Uh, both of them were, were, I would say, successful. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the unit I was with, uh, we looked for hard targets, uh, uh, military information, and uh, we'd get back and, and tell the people where the bad guys were and mm -hmm. tell them to go get them. Hey, while I'm, I'm asking you about what unit you were in, I'm gonna show a book here because there's a book written about mm -hmm. your unit. What was your unit? What this was, was the 5th Regimental Combat Team from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, what are we looking at on the cover here? This is uh, Sergeant Chang looking out at a dead uh, North Korean soldier. Uh, there's another guy back here. Mm -hmm. uh, so Now you're in some of these pictures. Yeah, there's a couple of them in there. They're not face to face, but... Uh, this, is the, this, this won a Pulitzer Prize, didn't it? Yes, this, uh -huh. And this is by Chang himself. Right. Chang mm -hmm. took this picture. What's going on in this picture? Uh, this is a picture of the medic here is writing out the death certificate for his best buddy who was killed. Oh, man. And um, he's taken it pretty hard. Oh, that's tough. Uh, and uh, this was taken in the uh, 18th of August, 1950, uh, mm -hmm. outside of a, a town called Maison Ni on a mountain called Sobuk San. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you, saw, you saw a lot of carnage, and I bet you grew up pretty fast, didn't you? Uh, right. About five minutes, you're a veteran. About five minutes. And there's a picture of you. Now, where are you? Point right yourself. Here. You're this fellow right here. Yeah. You smoked back then, didn't yeah, you? Because I can see a cigarette <laughs> yeah, in your Yeah, I did hand. then. And, and there's a, you're looking over, you and your, uh, your fellow soldiers are looking over a broad valley there. Mm -hmm. What's going on? That's an artillery barrage that, uh, of the targets that we had spotted. Uh, out there, so mm -hmm. uh, the artillery battalion is the 555 field artillery, the famous triple nickel. And so you and your guys identified that, and, mm -hmm. and so they're doing artillery based on your identification. Right. There. Mm -hmm. You're re re reconnoitering, is that yeah, what it's called? Yeah, that's a recon. Recon, right. yeah, yeah. Wow, well congratulations, it looked like you had a good day on that one. Oh, yeah. had better days. <laughs> yeah. This is, a, this is an incredible book. It reads like a diary. It's actually a day-by-day -day, uh, mm -hmm. uh, account of your um, we talked about you being 17 years old. Now, here is a fresh-faced kid, boy. Yeah. This was uh, you at, uh, at, what, 16 or 17? Uh, I was uh, 17. I had just graduated from the Non-Commissioned Officers Academy. Uh, today's Army, they wear uh, what they call drill sergeant hats. Mm -hmm. Look like the state police. But in my Army, the old brown shoe Army, we, this was your mark of authority, the brass whistle. Ah. And uh, when you graduated from then, uh, 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 I was already assigned to the 5th RCT. The war hadn't started yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was on my way to uh, join them in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And I joined them in uh, January of 50, and the war started six months later. You know, I'm going to hold these two pictures up, not because they're great pictures, <laughs> but they show the difference between you. Now, I see you on the right there. You've got yeah. the helmet on. Yeah. And you're kind of monkeying around. You've got a bayonet in your mouth, and you're right. kind of acting fierce, aren't you? Right. But a year later... You didn't have that kind of sense of humor about no, what I you did were not. doing. We're looking at the one on the left there, and there you are. I hadn't serious. even turned 18 yet. This was in July. I turned 18 <laughs> in August, and this was after my 19th birthday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And much more serious. Now, I also asked you to bring in your medals. Now, if we look at your chest, let's start by looking at your chest. You brought in all of these. These are miniatures, right? Yes. Uh -huh. But on the table over here, we can take a look at all of the medals that you won. And I didn't ask you to bring these in because I wanted you to brag about yourself. I wanted people to get a sense for the kinds of things that you went through during Korea. And Could I correct you just are, one moment? You, you bet. Go ahead. You use the term won. We don't win these. You earn them, don't you? You earn them. I'm sorry. And they're awarded. I, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I'm not, I'm not military, and I appreciate that. Okay. You bet. Now, here's a Purple Heart. 
which means that you got injured in action, yes. I guess, right? Mm -hmm. And this one, you're particularly proud of this one. That's the combat infantryman's badge. That's the badge that uh, everybody tries to get, but it's only awarded to the people that have actually been in combat with the enemy. Mm -hmm. Now, this one is significant. This one says Korea on it. Why mm -hmm. is this one significant? That's the only... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's the only medal ever issued by the United Nations. It is uh, the uh, first time that a unit was under unified command of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And uh, only the veterans of the Korean War were issued that medal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're going to show this one too, because this is the one that, uh, of all the medals given to military, this is what, the third most that's esteemed? That's the third highest, well, that's mm -hmm. a silver star, yes. And what's the significance of the silver star? Uh, for heroic action above and beyond the call of duty. When you think back on those days, Jerry, um, are, you, are you glad you went through it? Absolutely. Made a better man out of me. Mm -hmm. I stayed in the military for the sole purpose of carrying on a tradition that if it hadn't been for the veterans of World War II staying in the military, I wouldn't have survived because my unit was 90% veterans and they didn't let us young kids make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to pass on what they taught me, what I learned on my own, to the younger generation. I retired from the military, my son has retired from the military, and my grandson's been <laughs> for 14 years, and he's also 82nd Airborne. I'll be darned. Well, congratulations. So, it, it sounds like they learned pretty well from you. Uh, uh, we're a proud family. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Well, Pat, you have a segment here called Scenes of War, and we mentioned that this, this was the first time helicopters were used widespread in, a, in, a, in war. And here you see it over, uh, I guess, a battleship or some destroyer or some kind of craft there. But you can see that there are many of them. Here's another, here's another helicopter picture here. There's one above. It got used a lot, didn't it? Oh, it did. It, it made a, a significant difference to military operations where, you know, helicopters not only for supplies but getting uh, troops into areas that they weren't able to get in uh, before. So mm -hmm. it made a, a significant uh, contribution to the war efforts mm -hmm. and without it we probably would have had a, a major major problems yeah we're looking at a picture now this is significant why right well this is the this was the uh, the Korean War was the first uh, military uh, uh, conflict where African-American troops were incorporated into uh, the units of uh, American uh, uh, mil military uh, battalions and divisions and that so that was very significant because in World War II uh, African Americans did participate, uh, you know, very her heroic and, and won many awards, but they were always African American separate uh, units. Mm -hmm. And in this, in, in, in this military conflict, they were incorporated in with the other uh, 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 white troops. Yeah. We also mentioned the weather and how brutal it must oh. have been up, up near the North Korea yes. border, yes. Uh, up in the mountains up there. You can see that they're, they're really struggling. Over here. Well, it, it was. Again, uh, they could have, uh, uh, you know, uh, 20 below zero, whatever. I mean, again, uh, you really had issues with clothing. And then the, yeah. uh, the opposite, during the, the, the warm weather, you could have 100 degrees and 130 uh, humidity, mm. uh, degrees humidity. So it, was, uh, it really took a toll on a, a lot of uh, Americans. And we lost uh, in 50% uh, of our uh, POWs that were captured were in the first six months of the war, American POWs. And many, many of them died in prisons in, in North Korea and that, at lack of medicine mm -hmm. and also because of the weather. Now, now, the North Koreans got a quick start in this it, war. They did. Um, in fact, they got down into Seoul and even south of Seoul early on. That's what made this battle, landing at Incheon, so important, wasn't yes, it? Yes, Incheon was probably in, a, in Ameri American military history, will go down as, as one of the uh, most significant battles ever fought because uh, what MacArthur did and came uh, General MacArthur came up with the idea let's go behind the enemy and uh, you know not just a, f a few units or a few trips troops you had significant supplies and military equipment that had to be uh, shipped in mm -hmm. and so they they went up in behind into the North Korean area in Incheon and there they were able to cut off the uh, North Koreans and their supplies and that. And that made a significant uh, difference in the beginning of the war. Well, Floyd Cooper, when you were a 20-year-old man in Decatur, uh, you knew that sooner or later you were going to get drafted. Yes. So you enlisted. That's correct. And it didn't take long for them to train you and send you to Korea. 
About six months. Yeah. Did you feel adequately trained by the time you got there? Yes. I, I, you know, as far as you can go, training. Mm -hmm. you know, the next step is getting shot at. Yeah. Which which you happen to see a lot. Yes. You yeah. were a marine. That's correct. And you were a machine gunner. Yes. When I got to Korea, I was a machine gunner. But in the United States or in the states, I was trained as a tanker. And uh, I. Uh, got overseas and they needed machine gunners worse than they needed tankers mm -hmm. and I had machine gun experience from the tanks so I became a machine gunner. Mm -hmm. Didn't like it very mm -hmm. well but you go where they tell you. Sure. You were, if, if you're envisioning this uh, with, a, with a, a, a group like yours, you're on foot. You all have, you have a variety of weapons. You were the machine yeah. gunner but you've got guys that have uh, bazookas, and you've got guys who have other types of, of guns. True. And, and you are all sort of attacking, right? And then you get down and you throw that machine gun, it's got like a cross uh, tripod. tripod on it, and you start firing. You lay on the ground and start firing. You told me that there was more um, artillery and am ammunition used in, in the Korean War than in all of World War II. Oh, so you saw a lot of this kind of stuff. Constant booming and banging, constant. The, uh, uh, it's the longest continuous war that we ever fought. Because mm -hmm. once we uh, got to Korea, we had combat every day until a ceasefire. Someplace, you know, mm -hmm. not clear across the line, mm -hmm. but they'd probe us. Mm -hmm. trying to find an opening to get through. And uh, the, the enemy was always probing. They were always looking for a way to end. They didn't want to negotiate a peace. Mm -hmm. Didn't want to negotiate it. Mm -hmm. So you, you were attacking and, and counterattacking all the time, all day the time. after day after day. Didn't you ever just get weary? Just so weary that you couldn't stand it? Not really. I, uh, I just accepted what was there and it's a job I had to do. I did it and you know I, I grew up on a farm and he had a job to do every mm -hmm. day and you had to do mm -hmm. it. You received a lot of incoming fire as yeah. well as putting out a lot oh, of yeah. fire, didn't you? Oh yeah. Did you ever get close to getting shot? Yes. They, they were whizzing all over the place, huh? I've had bullets splat within that far of my mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. in the ground around me. Yeah. Yeah, and I assume you saw people die and saw people Correct. wounded. Correct. Um, when you look back on, on those days now, uh, what, what, what comes to your mind? Uh, it was quite a time in my life, personal life, uh, something that uh, I'll remember my whole life as if it happened moments ago. Wow. Uh, I, I found out that we have to be strong. We cannot deal from weakness. We have to deal from strength. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I know there's a lot of people who do not like the military, the war. I don't like it either. But sometimes we have to stand up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a different war. I admire the young men and women today it's fighting because they don't know who their enemy is most mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah. I knew who my enemy was. Yeah. He was a little guy who wore a funny looking uniform. and, and uh, He was, was Chinese tough, primarily, wasn't he? All Chinese. Because mm -hmm. you, were, you were up in the 38th parallel, which was that contested the DMZ, I guess is what they right. called it. Yeah. And yeah. so the Chinese were constantly, you were constantly back and forth there, right. weren't you? Right. Um, did you ever get injured? Yes. I got wounded on my 21st birthday. Uh, killed a Marine that I was carrying. I was carrying a wounded Marine from supposedly, I was trying to get him to safety and the shell went off behind us mm -hmm. and killed him and wounded me. And now on every birthday, it's a special birthday. Wow. Thank you, Floyd. Yeah, you're welcome. 
You know, Pat, this was probably the first time that American movie stars and famous people went abroad to entertain troops, huh? Oh, it was. I mean, you needed a morale booster, and I think, uh, of course, Bob Hope uh, had, you know, uh, did uh, uh, different shows for, for troops during World War II, but he was also a good morale booster for, mm -hmm. for troops, and he would go over to, to uh, the, the Korean War. And Marilyn Monroe, you know, talk about uh, uh, morale booster. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, in, in a war, you, you have to have, uh, it's, it's, it's a brutal uh, situation, and any, any time you can ease the burden. As I said, laughter helps ease the burdens of mm -hmm. war, and it kind of got the, uh, the troops, uh, even if it was just for an hour, hour and a half, to, to meet some of the uh, uh, entertainment uh, entertainers from the United States or from all over the, over the world would come over and kind of help out the boys and the gals. Again, mm -hmm. the, the war also included uh, uh, women, uh, of course, as nurses and that, uh, same, same uh, uh, positions they held during World War II, mm -hmm. but a little bit more uh, right on the front lines. Mm -hmm. Uh, but again, the, the war, if, if, if the, the guys could get away from even a few minutes, like I said, whether playing a, a cards or playing yeah. a game of baseball, that, made, uh, that was a morale booster for them. Just over your left shoulder, there's a table where people are negotiating. And this is really an interesting, I'm talking about right here, right. this is really an interesting story because the South Korean president sort of uh, fudged on this one, didn't he? Right. Matter of fact, uh, he was kind of a hell raiser and, and he wanted it his way. And matter of fact, uh, South Korea didn't even have a, a seat at the uh, negotiating table. Mm -hmm. he was, uh, it was really between the North uh, Koreans and uh, the UN mm -hmm. slash uh, United States uh, military. And uh, uh, kind of got back at him, uh, Sin Kim Reid, the, the uh, president of South Korea, one of the, the key elements of their negotiation was that all uh, POWs of, that were North Korean that had been, uh, were down in South Korea were supposed to go back up to North Korea when they were released. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but a lot of them did not want to, and Sigmund Rhee wanted to get back by not being part of the negotiations, so he let them all go, and that really set back negotiations for There goes your time. bargaining power, right? You bet, you bet. So uh, uh, he understood uh, what was going on, but uh, also the North mm -hmm. Koreans knew that a lot of their their soldiers would not want to come back and they wanted them back. And that tells you what conditions must have been like in North Korea if prisoners of war didn't want to be let loose. Exactly, wow. exactly. And, and you know, the POWs, as I said earlier, for Americans, this was more soldiers, American soldiers were captured as POWs mm -hmm. in, the, in the Korean War than any other war. Yeah, wow. And, uh, uh, and the, the largest percentage of, uh, of uh, POWs uh, never made it out alive mm -hmm. uh, compared to uh, uh, other wars. Mm -hmm. So again, it was a significant uh, military yeah. uh, uh, a conflict that, that kind of changed the rules of war. Yeah. And as in Vietnam, coming home was, was really a, a, a almost bittersweet. I'm sure that all of the soldiers were tickled to death to come home, but they came home without victory. It was a sort of a bittersweet experience. And uh, uh, they didn't get the kind of rousing welcome that the World War they II did, vets did. Yeah, they? they did not, and I think that kind of set the presidents with the with the uh, uh, the Korean War and wars after that up till the present time. Uh, the uh, again, the Vietnam War was the same way. I remember my uncle who was uh, in Korea uh, when he came home uh, here to Decatur. He was trying to get a bus home, and he ran into a neighbor, and the neighbor said, "Yeah, I haven't seen you for a long time. Where you been?" And, and my uncle was kind of hurt, and he said, I've been over in Korea. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, there were, uh, locally, there were no parades and no welcome home. Yeah. So talk about a morale downer, uh, again, but the soldiers wanted to come home. That was oh, the key. Home, sure. home to family and friends and, and uh, to the, uh, the area that they knew and, and the, the sights and, and smells that, that was part of, uh, of their America. There, there, there's no place like home. And this, of course, now people who have been to Washington, D.C. and seen the monuments there will recognize this. We did build a wonderful monument to those soldiers. Yeah, it was dedicated uh, uh, by uh, President Bush and, 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 and others in 1995, and it was uh, very significant. And I have not seen it myself, but I've, I've been told by even non-Korean veterans that it really takes your breath away and it, it looks mm -hmm. like those, those soldiers are, uh, like it's actually raining on them, uh, that, that they just like they're, they're alive. Mm -hmm. And someday I hope to see it. The Korean War, the Forgotten War, can be viewed at the Macon County History Museum through the end of the year. With another Illinois story in Decatur, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching.
For a DVD copy of this episode of Illinois Stories, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois, 62708. Be sure to include the program name, broadcast date, and topic. You may also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605 or by using our secure server by going online to networkknowledge.tv. 